Look at schools, particularly universities that are outside the four major urban centers in the country. Look at who lives in the rich areas of town, who's at the top of corporate ladders. I've, I've already alluded to racial profiling by police when I talked about my experience and, and, and that of a thief. Look at the, uh, the recent problems that have been going on in Canada with uh, Mexican immigrants or the, the tumult that happened just a few weeks ago when Tamil refugees started arriving by boat. Anyone who believes that the same amount of fuss would have been kicked up if we had been talking about refugees from Belgium or Sweden is far more credulous than I am. When we ignore our societal impulse towards racism and look the other way when racist events occur, we grant implicit license to racist attitudes, allowing these kinds of things to happen more and more often, sneaking in the back door of our own ignorance. So another popular option is one that I myself bought into when I was a kid, and this is the idea of being colorblind. Basically, the logic goes that if you simply refuse to see race, then it can't affect your decision making. You'll treat everyone exactly the same regardless of their race or ethnicity. Now this is the origin or the root of the phrase, race doesn't matter to me. Now superficially, this might seem like a great idea. You won't treat anyone differently, and as a result, everyone will be the same in your eyes. Brandisha Tynes, a professor of African American Studies and Psychology in the United States, conducted an experiment on college students at the University of Illinois. A sample of students with about a three to one ratio of black to white was given a scale that's designed to measure their level of colorblindness. The survey asked them to identify how strongly they agree with statements affirming or denying the merits of being colorblind. Next, the same students were asked to perform an exercise in social networking. They were given some photos and asked to comment on them as though they were posted on a friend's Facebook profile. Now, some of these photos were incredibly racist, depicting students dressed in blackface or dressed up like caricatures of Hispanic people with offensive phrases written on their t-shirts. The students' responses to these photos was classified based on the type of sentiment expressed in the comments. Were they not bothered? Were they not really that bothered? Were they bothered a bit or were they outright angry about what they saw? The graph in this slide shows what kinds of people had different kinds of responses. And as you can see, there's a clear association between color blindness and how bothered you are by clear examples of racism. Those students who were the most colorblind were the least likely to notice overt racism. Whereas those who didn't see themselves as colorblind at all had no problem either noticing or commenting when these samples, when these examples were presented to them. Now, interestingly, or perhaps predictably, when white students were, the, the white students were simultaneously more likely to call themselves colorblind, and they were less likely to be bothered by overt racism than the black students were. So here's the problem with the idea of colorblindness. It doesn't work. When you neglect the reality of race-based differences, you simultaneously neglect the real impact they have as a direct consequence of ignoring them. The only way this philosophy could possibly work is if everyone was blind to color, particularly those who were disproportionately harmed by it. And in order for it to have any benefit, there would have to be no race-based disparities in society whatsoever, which is putting the cart before the horse. You can't solve a problem by ignoring it. So my usual response to people who say that race isn't important to them, or to say that race, you know, it's not important, I ask, to whom is it unimportant? Many people feel the lash of racial inequality on a daily basis. I hang out with my friends and I'm acutely aware of the fact that usually I'm the only dark-skinned person in the room. It's sort of like the study of theology. Just because the thing that you're talking about doesn't exist, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have real power. Tim Wise, who's a brilliant author and anti-racist thinker from the United States, says that it's more accurate to call it color mutinous 
We see the effects, but we don't talk about them. And as I've said all along, ignoring the problem does not make it go away. Racism is real, and ignoring it does not help. So what can we do? Is it possible to notice the differences between people without judging them based on those differences? I think it's fairly obvious that such a thing is easily possible, since groups of people who aren't clones of each other seem to get along just fine. So I submit to you that the only way to accomplish such a task is to redraw our in-group concept. By this, I mean we can redefine our labels of us and them in a way that takes race out of the equation. This can be accomplished by encouraging the kinds of programs that tear down racial silos and encourage mutual cooperation among members of society. I want to introduce you to a classic study of in-group biases and how they propagate and how to tear them down. Mostly, what doesn't work. This is a study published by Sharif and colleagues in 1961. And just as a preamble, I want to state there's no possible way that anyone would get permission to reproduce this study today. So just be glad for the shaky ethics of the 1950s. A group of 22 boys were selected to go to summer camp. They had been matched for age. They had been matched for income, behavioral characteristics, and other traits. Uh, once matched, they were randomly selected into two groups and then given some time to gel. The important thing here to remember is that as far as was possible, the two groups were identical. One wasn't stronger or smarter or faster or whatever than the other. So keep that in mind as we move on. So the groups were introduced to each other at the camp. And pretty much immediately, they began exhibiting out-group hostility. The swimming hole, or the batting cage, or the big rock became our swimming hole, our batting cage, our big rock, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't until the two groups met each other, incidentally, that they found it necessary to come up with team names. So the two groups started competing in games like tug of war and baseball and a variety of other things. Now, a level of animosity is revealed in the study that shocks me a bit. Because I remember going to camp, and I made friends with kids who weren't in my own group, but that's not really important. The rivalry escalated to a point where they were openly insulting and mocking each other pulling all kinds of stunts, basically being a bunch of little assholes. At this point, a survey tool was administered to each boy, asking them to evaluate their group and the other group. As you'd expect, they thought their own group was smarter, faster, and generally better than the other one. An interesting side finding is that those group members that had the lowest status in the group held the strongest negative opinions of those in the other group. Now try not to read too much into the similarity between who's the most racist in our society, but it's an interesting avenue uh, and an interesting coincidence. So now that the experimenters had created outright hatred between two groups of innocent boys, ah, uh, the 50s. It was time to try to make friends out of the groups. Now first the experimenters thought, Let's bring the groups together more often. Surely you've heard the idea that if you integrate schools, you'll reduce race-based hostility. And this does happen, but not simply because the kids learn to ignore the differences between each other. When the kids in the groups were uh, encouraged to do things together, uh, whether it be sports or dining or watching movies, the group affiliations and hostility persisted. Mere exposure is not enough to overcome in-group biases. Now what the experimenters did next is the crux of my presentation. Instead of simply waiting for the groups to dissolve spontaneously, they created circumstances under which the two groups had to cooperate to achieve a mutually beneficial goal. They plugged the water cistern and made the campers solve the problem. They had the group choose between seeing a movie and then doing something else with a small amount of money that they were given. They arranged to have the bus going out of camp mired in a ditch and had the kids pull it out. 
yeah, as I said, these things definitely wouldn't pass a research ethics board today, but we'll move on. This graph shows the before and after valuations of the in and out groups. And as you can see from the bars here, favoring one's own group diminished somewhat and the evaluation of members of the other groups improved. We have to remember that we're talking about 22 kids at a summer camp back in 1961. This is probably not a faithful representation of the world at large, but it may be illustrative of a larger point. We have some real questions that we ought to ask about this study. Would these groups eventually have become friends given enough time? What would we have to do to completely eliminate any study bias? But the results do suggest that if we want to reduce barriers between groups, fostering mutual cooperation is one useful avenue. Considering that we've established that race is fairly arbitrarily determined, could we use this approach to remove the stigma of looking different without having to stick our fingers in our ears and pretend that differences don't exist or that they don't exert influence? Look at how the definition of what a white person is has changed in the past hundred years. Italians, Polish, Irish, Germans, many different groups of white people weren't granted the same privileges and status of being really white until fairly recently. You can track the formation of outgroup biases by which countries are approved for immigration. The second most recent arrivals cling to the majority against the newcomers. These are two examples of zero-sum shifting where life doesn't really improve overall. It just, the burden shifts to another group. But what about what happened during the Olympics? We saw crowds of Pakistani, Chinese, Indian, Mexican, European, Caribbean people all flying the national banner, all proud to be Canadian. We didn't have to exclude or hate anyone else. We just focused on what was for us a mutual struggle. So in the brief time I, had le I have left, I'd like to explain why I think the skeptic movement and skeptical thought are uniquely well-placed to address the issues around race and racism. First, skeptics live and breathe for scientific evidence. And if there was ever a discussion that needed to be informed by science, it's this one. Some of you may know Christopher DiCarlo. He's an ethicist who started a campaign to explore some of the implications of archaeological evidence that points to a common human origin in Africa. There's mounting genetic evidence to suggest that the differences observed between different racial groups are almost entirely cosmetic, and that there's no difference in terms of ability between the different groups. Now, it's hard to blame a minority group for being stupid or lazy once you realize that our political realities are the product of our environment, not our genetics. It's also important to examine the causes and effects of racial inequalities and to evaluate how well programs that are designed to reduce these inequalities, how well are they working? This kind of inquiry requires evidence-based reasoning and the scientific method. Next, skeptics are in a position to demand rationality in race-based discussion. When someone says X is true about group A, skeptics are already in the habit of asking the question, how do you know that? Since we know that racism is completely non-scientific, turning our skeptical gaze on this phenomenon will bring some comprehension into the mainstream. Finally, most skeptics are secular humanists, and the humanist principles of equality are, the, are best suited to the mutual benefit of all people, whether they're in the majority or the minority. So now that you've been armed with this information, what do we do with it? First, we need to stop pretending that race is a scary thing that only dark-skinned people are allowed to talk about. We need to be talking more about it. Everyone does. And we need to be speaking intelligently. If Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh and other racists are the only ones who are allowed to talk about racism, we are in a serious predicament. Second, the word